really uh, talk, uh, go through an example of a negative externality um, because we did one in class, but I, I just know, uh, generally speaking, um, that people tend to have um, issues uh, with the math behind them. And so I just wanted to sort of walk you through it a little bit real quick and just make sure that everybody's sort of on, on board here. Um, the thing about uh, negative externalities is that we want to kind of start from them, uh, you know, sort of thinking about this from the context of, um, you know, what's going on uh, in equilibrium, you know, and sort of what's what the market is wanting to be at. You know, that's the thing about markets is that economists believe that they are they are always moving towards their equilibrium. And so in this context, uh, in what again, whatever market this is, we can see that the equilibrium is a price of $5 um, and a quantity of 500. So to an economist, what this would suggest is that whatever this market is, it is if it's not currently in equilibrium, it will eventually get to equilibrium um, and it will stay there. Um, the curves may shift to new equilibriums, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we, we uh, you know, assuming uh, neoclassical competitive assumptions of markets, we expect markets to stay uh, in equilibrium over time. And so it's always good for us to kind of start from this, you know, beginning. OK, so again, we have the, the, the basic um, supply and demand equalization with uh, uh, profit, excuse me, a uh, market clearing price of five dollars, uh, market equilibrium, private market equilibrium or competitive market equilibrium. These are all interchangeable concepts um, and a uh, private market equilibrium quantity of 500 units. And then here you, here you can see that I've calculated a consumer and producer surplus. You just remember is that uh, the first fundamental welfare theorem, which is uh, a theorem which is largely inspired by the neoclassicals, um, which says that uh, competitive markets maximize economic efficiency, you know, basically uh, free markets. Um, so again, the first fundamental welfare theorem says that competitive markets maximize economic efficiency. So in a sense, we're saying that, that we can do no better than a price of five and, and the quantity of 500. And even more than that, that, that $5 is an accurate representation of the value of this product. Um, we talked about this in class um, last time, but we talked about this vertical distance here um, between uh, the equilibrium and the equilibrium quantity uh, is the, the private value of the product. Um, and so what this implies is that if this market is in equilibrium, then to society, indeed, uh, this product is worth $5. Um, and then all the economic decisions that are made to consume and produce the product at $5 are therefore efficient. Any economic decisions that are being made at prices other than $5 is inefficient. Um, and so that's kind of where we come from, that idea that, that competitive markets maximize economic efficiency. And the way that we show this is we, is we show that uh, consumer and producer surplus uh, are maximized at equilibrium, which, which they are. They, they can, they, the only way that consumer and producer surplus um, are maximized is actually at equilibrium. Um, but of course, what we're interested in is what goes on when the market creates damage outside of itself. Um, you know, through pollution or other other types of environmental degradation, say maybe deforestation. And what we're interested in is, you know, just on the surface level, how can we think about this in the context of why is it occurring? Um, why does pollution exist? Um, we can give a relatively banal example or banal explanation that pollution exists because we need to grow the economy. But more than that, since pollution negatively affects us, um, the question becomes why haven't we or why haven't markets corrected themselves? Um, nobody likes pollution necessarily, even though we may benefit from it economically. Why haven't markets solved it necessarily? Uh, now, certainly there are innovations in industries that are heavily polluted or, or heavy pollution industries in which businesses attempt to reduce their pollution through technological innovation. Um, for example, scrubbers on cold fire power plants are machines that you actually put at the top of your smokestacks that remove some of the particulate matter um, from the, the coal emissions. Um, and removing that particulate matter lowers um, instances of asthma, lowers uh, potential instances of lung cancer, um, and it just improves the air quality. Uh, and, the, and these are costly, so it costs the firm money to reduce the particulate matter from uh, their coal fire. And so uh, the fact is, is that, again, since this represents a private cost to the uh, business, um, but the 
benefit that they're producing uh, it does not accrue to themselves, it accrues to the person or the people who benefit from reduced pollution, then again, because markets are based upon self-preservation and um, self-interest, we don't expect markets to solve these issues. They, they, so the real point of externalities is to really kind of drive home that point of negative externalities. They, they kind of exist outside of the market themselves, so the market itself will never be able to solve it. And this is why we call a negative externality a market failure, because the market will fail to be efficient. Um, we show a negative externality, and here again, just like in class, um, we show it on the, the supply side. Um, we show it simply by considering that uh, the product has marginal damage, or what we called in class marginal external damage. Um, here, that marginal external damage is uh, $3, um, as we can see. Um, and if we'll notice that uh, the uh, social supply curve is shifted up from the private supply curve by exactly three dollars um, and we can see that when we do this we have uh, a deadweight loss triangle here now this deadweight loss again deadweight loss meaning a loss of economic efficiency um, this uh, deadweight loss exists at the private market equilibrium um, at five dollars uh, a price of five dollars and at a quantity of 500 um, and so this is produced when the private market is in equilibrium um, and the private market on top of that will not see this deadweight loss, so it will not be able to react um, to, uh, to internalized externality. Um, and so the issue that we are faced with is that we want to get the economy, or excuse me, we want to get the market to operate um, at social efficiency. Um, and social efficiency is found at the intersection of the social supply curve and the private uh, demand curve right here um, and but the, again like I said in class we can't expect firms to do this on their own um, so what we're doing here when we illustrate the social supply curve is we're simply saying that if the market were able to internalize the externality that is the marginal damage what would this look like well it would push the cost of production up Imagine that instead of simply uh, emitting pollution in the atmosphere, firms actually had to pay um, for the environmental cost of that pollution, which oftentimes is, is what we at least attempt to make businesses do, although not always successfully. Then what this does is it increases the cost of production to the firm, right? Now, every time they produce a unit, they have to pay for the pollution that's produced from it. Uh, it's no different than if the cost of, uh, you know, any raw material goes up. It's just a, an increase in the cost of production. And when you have an increase in the cost of production, if you'll recall from uh, Echo uh, 106, um, this causes a shift uh, back into the left of the supply curve, um, which we show very, very simply here. Um, and so you can kind of think about this uh, a couple different ways. Um, I think the easiest way to think about it is that um, the issue with externalities is that they exist outside of the market. If we can get uh, the producer in this circumstance with a negative production externality, if we can get the producer to internalize the externality, then the supply curve will shift back into the left. Um, by the amount uh, of uh, marginal damage, um, if we appropriate, if we set a regulation or a tax, or uh, we'll talk about cap and trade program next week, um, if we set the, the the parameters of those correctly, um, then we actually will in fact have a, a shift back of the supply curve, um, and we'll get to that uh, point of social efficiency um, with a price uh, of six dollars and fifty cents. I don't have it written here, but six dollars and fifty cents uh, in a quantity of three hundred and fifty units. Again, the the basic idea is that a private market fails in the face of a negative externality by overproducing the good, 500 versus 350, and charging too low a price for it, $5 versus $6.50. Um, and so this is the basic idea of a negative externality, and, and economists uh, contextualize this uh, as something for which markets cannot solve. Um, there is oftentimes an argument made that, well, if you just have informed consumers and then informed consumers can only buy from those businesses, say, that don't pollute very much, then the market will have an incentive now to reduce pollution. But again, like I mentioned in class, so much of this uh, is a problem of information itself that oftentimes we don't actually know what the environmental impact of our consumption actually is. And so even though we might be someone who would reduce our consumption of polluting products, 
we don't because we don't realize that we're consuming very polluting products. And so again, you know, the information the information plays a really big part here. Um, now this may change over time. You you may have consumers that over time um, become more aware. Um, and if the, if that's the case, then then in fact you may see uh, a reduction in the demand for a product, um, which could in fact get us to social efficiency. Um, if the demand curve, in fact, here were to shift back by three dollars, um, so in other words, another way to, that you could solve the negative externality instead of having the supply curve shift, you could um, have the demand curve shift back exactly by three dollars again, and that would get us to social efficiency uh, here of 350 units. Um, and so again, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, sort of how the externality is internalized, whether it's internalized by consumers or whether it's internalized by producers. The fact is, is that without uh, government intervention uh, or without some other way of getting that externality inside of the market, we don't expect the market to A, see the externality, uh, and then B, reduce it. Um, one of the things that I talked about in class, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more on Monday, um, is this concept called the Pagovian tax. Um, and the idea behind the Pagovian tax is that if you set a tax uh, equal to marginal damage, um, here again, we're sticking with the production externality. So we're going to tax producers of the product. Um, all we have to do is tax producers of the product by the amount of marginal damage. And again, it has the exact same effect as what I was just describing. If I tax a business by $3 per unit, this increases the cost of production for that firm by $3 per unit. And so this would cause a shift of the supply curve back into the left by $3, which would get us right back to social efficiency. Um, and the beauty of this is that we get to social efficiency and we also generate tax revenue. So not only are we reducing pollution, but we're also reducing, or I'm sorry, we're giving ourselves a pool of money that can be used in a number of ways. Oftentimes, when we're using taxes to reduce a negative externality, whether it's something like cigarettes, for example, we often feel that the burden of ta taxation will fall most heavily on low income consumers. So one of the things that economists often suggest is that because uh, such Pagovian taxation not only reduces the damage of a negative externality, but also generates uh, tax revenue. We refer to this as the double dividend. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to now take this revenue and, and spend it in ways that further reduce the externality. We did this with cigarettes, in fact. Um, we used tax revenue from cigarettes to do two uh, really important things. One, we paid for the health care costs of smokers. Um, and two, we used that money to create ad campaigns that discourage people from smoking, which have been very successful. And so taxes actually offer governments a two-pronged approach to reducing the externality. Now, of course, this requires that uh, uh, you know, the government actually spends the money wisely in a way that will further reduce the externality. Um, but, you know, that, that there's the option is there, uh, to say the least. The other thing that I want to point out real quick before we move on is that uh, the Deadweight loss that arises from the private market outcome uh, goes away at social efficiency. Um, and so those of you who remember from 106, you'll, uh, you may be saying to yourself, but I thought a tax created deadweight loss. Um, normally a tax would create deadweight loss, but the reason why a tax would create deadweight loss is because we were suggest, uh, assuming that the private market equilibrium was in fact efficient. But we know that this, in fact, is not efficient because there's a negative externality. So this private market equilibrium is no longer efficient. Therefore, that a tax takes us away from this uh, equilibrium, uh, this, uh, in fact, as long as the tax takes us to the socially efficient point of uh, 350 units, then uh, it actually gets rid of this deadweight loss uh, as opposed to creating additional deadweight loss. So the, the beauty of Pagovian taxation is, again, if we actually know what marginal damage is, and that's actually going to be something that we talk about today is how do we value marginal damage. Um, then we can set an appropriate tax, and, and from at least from a theoretical perspective, economists believe that uh, you know something relatively similar to this is what will occur.